This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you are very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Today we are hot-footing it over to the later Georgian period to take a look at the life and legacy of a man who has been referred to as, quote, the first menswear influencer an individual who managed to reach the very zenith of the high society of his day, who counted nobles and royals among his friends and admirers. His name was George Brian Brummel, but you may know him better as Beau Brummel. Before we take a look at the man himself, I want to say an absolutely massive thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring another video on this channel. And I'm also very grateful to every one of you that have taken the time to check out my new website that I built using Squarespace that you can find at www.katrinamarchant.com. Thank you to all of you that have bought merch from the merch store. I am so pleased to read in my emails that some of them have arrived already and that you are enjoying them. For those of you who have signed up to the mailing list, I do hope that you found it helpful to get an inbox notification about my uploads and lives. And I also hope that you enjoyed getting your sneaky peek of the Friday video before anyone else. I do plan on continuing to do this. Now, I have been talking about launching my own website for a good few years, but honestly, I never knew how to even start. And I'm so thankful because Squarespace just made it all so straightforward whether it's adding new pages, editing existing ones, creating a merch shop or building a mailing list, I just don't see how they could have made things any simpler. And on top of this, on the back end, the analytics tools that Squarespace provides you with are also really easy to use and understand. So when it comes to you all building your own websites, you are going to be able to keep track of all of the traffic that comes to your site. From how many visitors you had to where they are based, to what content they engaged with the most on your site, to name just a few. I love the fact that I can use Squarespace through my desktop or laptop, but also through an app on my phone. Whether I'm analysing website traffic to editing the website itself, I can do all of it from anywhere. To build your own website, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And then when you're ready to launch your website, go to squarespace.com forward slash reading the past to save 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. But now it's time to take a look at arguably the most famous dandy of all time. Let's talk about Beau Brummel. Don't let the historical nature of Beau Brummel's life trick you, because for some, he seems to be very contemporary, fashionable even. References to him abound from people who are looking to sell a variety of goods and services. In addition to the numerous pubs, bars and restaurants that carry his name today, there is also a production company, a bespoke suit tailor in Hong Kong, a range of men's skincare and grooming products, and there's at least one franchise of barbers that offers the Beau Brummel as a treatment. His life has been memorialised in biographies, historical fiction, in plaques and in statues. In 2002, this statue of Beau by Irina Sedleka was installed in German Street. At his feet, the plinth on which his statue stands is engraved with one of his famous sayings. To be truly elegant one should not be noticed. I think perhaps we can take this as a sign that today the name Beau Brummel is, in the minds of many, synonymous with a good time, with luxury and with aesthetic concerns. And all of this is probably pretty understandable and it may become even more understandable as we delve into his biography. An article on Beau in the Gentleman's Gazette is titled Beau Brummel, the first menswear influencer. The rake calls him, quote, the originator of dandyism and asserts that although he was, quote, often misinterpreted as a fop, Beau Brummel was in fact 
an innovative dresser and arbiter of good taste, who laid the foundations for tailoring as we know it today. Meanwhile, Esquire chooses to take a wholly different tack for their article on Beau. He is castigated in the title, which reads, quote, Beau Brummel wasn't a hero of modern men's fashion. He was a villain. A boring, uptight villain. A polarising figure then, perhaps. But was this the case during his lifetime, or is it only in his contemporary legacy? Let's see what we can find out. George Brian Brummel, later better known as Beau, was born on the 7th of June 1778 at a very famous London address, arguably, I think, one of the most famous, Downing Street in Westminster. At the time of his birth, as the third and final child of his parents, William and Mary, the family was living there in Downing Street because of the father William's job. He was the private secretary of the then Prime Minister, Lord North, and that is the same Lord North whose daughter we did talk about briefly in my video on Ignatius Sancho, which I will leave linked, because she was the recipient of a dedication in one of Sancho's collections of musical compositions. When Beau was around four, the family finances were healthy enough to support the purchase of a property known as The Grove in Berkshire. This then became the family home where Beau would grow up. Through securing this place as Lord North's secretary and by flourishing in the position, Beau's father became the recipient of various perks, which it is believed earned him as much as £2,500 a year. A quick check with the trusty National Archives currency converter lets us know that £2,500 in 1780 is worth approximately £215,261.25 in 2017 money, which works out roughly to 16,666 days of wages for a skilled labourer of the time. This, I think, understandably, had the effect of providing opportunities for the Brummel children that William had not enjoyed himself. In short, this was social mobility in action. And so, Beau was sent off to the famed Eton College for his education, where, in addition to earning a reputation for being particularly skilled in the writing of Latin verse, he also experimented with his dress. The 19th century writer John Doran wrote that Beau, quote, not only modernised the white cravat or stock, which marks the Eton boy, but he put a gold buckle to it. In terms of his character at this time, Beau's more recent biographer, Philip Carter, writes how, quote, in his early life there also appears to have been a degree of compassion to others. Finding himself among a group of boys intent on throwing a boatman into the Thames, for example, he is reported to have requested that the man be spared since it was, quote, a certainty that he will catch cold. Such sensitivities were later abandoned in the competition of fashionable London society. His attendance at Eton brought him into the circles of those with generational power, wealth and influence. Beau joined them at work and at play. He would eventually find himself rubbing shoulders with George, Prince of Wales, at that prince's London pad, Carlton House. His connection to this group would only continue when he went to Oriel College in Oxford in the May of 1794. Beau's father had died a few months before this, in the March of 1794. When his father's estate was settled, it was determined that Beau would be in line to receive a handsome inheritance, totalling about £20,000 when he came of age. So, now let's return to our currency converter of choice, where we find that in 1790, £20,000 was the equivalent of £1,535,222 in 2017's money. Alternatively, that is 133,333 days of pay for a skilled tradesman of the time. Beau left Oxford not long after this. Indeed, Carter states that Beau's, quote, principal achievement while at Oxford was to perfect the cut the English art of ignoring people, though conscious of their presence. Brummel's favoured targets were former school friends whom he considered students at inferior colleges. Beau's interactions with George, Prince of Wales, evidently generated a positive impression of him in this royal mind. 
because at around the same time that Beau was leaving Oxford, the prince managed to find him a place. He made him a cornet, that is a commissioned officer in a British cavalry troop, albeit of the lowest grade. In this case, the troop in question was the Prince of Wales's own regiment, the 10th Hussars. In his new role, it seems that principally, Beau was intended to be George's dashing companion at the various numerous parties that this Prince of Wales so loved to attend. However, Beau was also expected to accompany his prince to festivities that this royal personage was far less keen to be at. An example of this is his wedding to Caroline of Brunswick, which took place on the 8th of April 1795. Now, I have made a video on this particular nuptial nightmare, which I will be leaving linked. But suffice to say, this wedding was an embarrassing spectacle that was only compounded by the high conflict nature of the whole marriage that followed it. Beau was promoted to captain in 1796. Doran writes, quote, Brummel, however, took the regent, meaning George, Prince of Wales, by storm. There was no resisting him. The prince was fascinated. Brummel might be absent from parade, neglect duties even more important, and laugh at all suggestion and reproach. Quote, Our general's friend was now the general. He did precisely what he pleased, nothing that he ought, and in three years he was full captain, to the full disgust of older officers, who enviously admired while they deeply cursed him. Beau left the army two years after his promotion to captain, apparently due to his distaste for a move to Manchester that he was being commanded to make. Beau was therefore retired by the time he was 21 years old. This was also the point when an individual was deemed to have, quote, come of age, and this, therefore, brought in the influx of funds in the form of Beau's inheritance, which was by then worth roughly £30,000. So, one more time, over to the currency converter. That is £1,322,187 in 2017's money, or 200,000 days of pay for a skilled labourer of the time. From his new residence at 4 Chesterfield Street in Mayfair, a property that would later be the home of the Prime Minister Anthony Eden, Beau played host to those within that rarefied social circle that he, seemingly, was so well ensconced within. Indeed, Beau would act as one of that group's leading tastemakers. And it was around this time that that name he is perhaps best known by now, Beau, began to be attached to him. Men's elite fashion at the end of the 18th century was typically made up of a frilled linen shirt, silk stockings, knee breeches, a kind of short trouser, a waistcoat and a long outer coat in a whole host of sometimes garish colours and patterns. Wigs were the order of the day and shoes with a low heel were also very much in vogue. Beau and the cohort that increasingly looked to him for guidance on how to dress, a cohort that included the Prince of Wales, became focused instead on precision tailoring of the finest quality cloth in a far more limited spectra of colours than had been enjoyed in the previous century. Taking it from the ground up, the fashion was for highly polished Hessian boots, long trousers. Beau apparently favoured buckskin, there would be an off-white linen shirt, a buff waistcoat, a dark blue coat, an impeccably knotted cravat, undressed hair and usually a top hat. Evening wear usually called for something a little different though. Slippers would replace the boots, probably because they were better for dancing but also because they allowed Beau's striped silk stockings to be decorously on view. The trousers were darker as was the waistcoat. The dark blue coat, linen shirt and cravat, however, remained. Beau famously had, frankly, exacting cravat standards. It should be perfect, but not too perfect. Knots that did not meet his requirements as they were would be retied until they did. It is said that it took Beau many hours to get ready each day, and frequently that the Prince of Wales would act as an audience for these particular ministrations. 
Carter lists some of the rumours that circulated and continue to circulate about Bo's dress, such as, quote, that the fingers of his gloves were made by different specialist glovers, that his boots were washed in champagne. The second of these rumours may have been intended to be a slight against a famous export from Britain's enemy nation during the Napoleonic Wars, France. Was this perhaps an attempt to show that French champagne was, in fact, only fit to clean British boots? That Beau would engage in an acerbic behaviour such as this is, I think, wholly believable, especially if we consider it in the light of the rest of his known activities. Bo gets the credit for influencing who to include and who to ostracise from being admitted to a variety of clubs and events and entertainments, in particular to Almax Assembly Rooms in London. Vouchers for entry to this place could be granted, but they could also be removed. And it was said that if Bo showed someone public favour, they rose in everyone's estimations. Perhaps a voucher may come their way. If, though, he was seen to ignore or cut them, they fell in favour and perhaps lost their voucher. Beau became accustomed to sitting at the ground floor window of White's Club in London. While there, he would observe passers-by and critique their dress, usually in a less than kind manner. It would be a mistake to think that he was doing this because he was shy of his opinions or that he was worried about someone overhearing him saying these things about them because Beau was not only comfortable passing cruel judgment behind people's backs, oh no, he was more than willing to do it to their face too. And when he did this, he was not selective in who he would target and was certainly no respecter of rank or degree. It seems that everyone was fair game to Beau. As the Prince of Wales put on weight, the idealised dandy presentation became harder and harder for him to achieve. Beau felt bold enough to mock the future monarch for this weight gain. This mocking gave way to quarrelling and finally to a total breach between the pair. George, it seems, had had enough. He regretted that he had, as he saw it, raised Beau to the place of fame and influence that he now enjoyed, and so he thought to show everyone that Beau was now out of favour in the hopes of somehow reducing him and perhaps his influence. While out walking, George encountered Beau and a companion. George ignored or cut him and spoke only to the companion. In response to this, Beau was said to have turned to his companion and inquired loudly about the prince, quote, Pray! Who is your fat friend? Whatever the intention had been with the plan to cut Bo in this way, his place was undiminished by his rift with George, even though George had recently become the Prince Regent. Bo instead began to associate with George's younger brother, Frederick, Duke of York, and with his wife, Frederica. Bo hosted lavish entertainments. He continued to spend extravagantly, too extravagantly as it would turn out because he would eventually outspend the limits of that inheritance that was providing for his living that in fact had to provide for his living considering Bo had chosen to retire from all employment around 15 years earlier. Bo turned to gambling in excess apparently in an attempt a futile attempt as it would turn out to generate the funds that were required for his lifestyle didn't seemingly think of returning to work at this point. Large-scale losses then led to mounting debts and his friends began to desert him. In 1814, he would lose another large wager, said to be about £10,000. He was now utterly unable to pay his debts and so threat of being placed in a debtor's prison loomed. He fled to Calais in 1816. A manuscript dated to 1822, which is attributed to Beau Brummel, is entitled Male and Female Costume, Grecian and Roman Costume, British Costume from the Roman Invasion until 1822, and the principles of costume applied to the improved dress of this present day. Beau had hopes of publishing this manuscript in order to generate at least some income, while also further staking his claim to be society's chief arbiter in matters of fashion. 
Unfortunately for Bow, this text would not be published until 1932. Indeed, for many decades, it was lost. By the end of the 1820s, Bow's financial strife was unabated and he found himself thus compelled to work. In September 1830, he moved to Calm to fill the office of Consul for the Department of Calvados. He was, however, dismissed from this post just two years later. In 1835, he was still in France and he was jailed there as a debtor. His health was also suffering by this point. Today, some believe that he had had a series of strokes that caused damage to his brain, while others say that the alteration in his physical health and mental state was in fact the result of end-stage syphilis. He was placed in Caen's Bon Sauveur Asylum in May 1839. He died there just under a year later, on the 30th of March 1840. So what do you think of Beau Brummel's life and legacy? Of the moments from it that we have explored today. As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video. I'd also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments too, because that does boost the engagement. And the more engagement a video gets, the more YouTube will share it out, which in turn helps to grow this community. As we have been talking about Brummel, what about we have an emoji that relates to men's clothing? You can pick which one you want and pop it down in the comments. You can also find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all of the places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and found it useful. And if you did, please share it with your friends. In fact, if you like my channel, please let some pals know about it. You can let me know that you like this particular video by hitting the thumbs up please subscribe to the channel. And if you think you're subscribed, please do have a little check now. Make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you. And while you are there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear so that YouTube will, they claim, tell you when I have next uploaded and when I am next planning to go live. But as a fail safe, which we now do have, please head over to my website, which I am going to link and add your email to the mailing list so that I can let you know what I'm up to that way too. I hope you can have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.